So we can go, I think we can proceed with the uh, Q&A session. And I think our guest, uh, I mean, there's no need to introduce our guest, but nevertheless, I will do this. Um, Steven Strogatz is a professor of applied mathematics at Cornell University. After graduating in mathematics from Princeton in 1980, he studied at Trinity College, Cambridge. Uh, he did doctoral work in applied mathematics at Harvard, followed by, uh, by a National Science Foundation a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard and Boston University. From 89 to 94, Professor Strogatz uh, taught in the Department of Mathematics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he joined the Cornell faculty in, in 94. He worked on a variety of problems in mathematical biology, including uh, the geometry of supercoiled DNA, the dynamics of the human uh, sleep-wake cycle, the topology of three-dimensional chemical waves, and the collective behavior of biological oscillators, for example, synchronously flashing fireflies. Uh, he also worked on nonlinear dynamics and chaos applied to physics, engineering, and biology. But perhaps his best known research contribution is his uh, 1998 paper in Nature all uh, on small world networks. I, I bet everyone knows this one here. Uh, the paper was co authored with his former student, Duncan Watts. And it was the most highly cited paper about networks between 98 and 2008 as well as the sixth most uh, highly cited paper on any topic in physics. Uh, his popular science articles have appeared in the New York Times, Wired, Quanta, and in many other magazines. Uh, he is also an author of uh, several books, Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos, Sync, The Calculus of Friendship, The Joy of X, and his most recent book, Infinite Powers, is a New York Times bestseller. So welcome. This is a ple pleasure to, to have you here, Professor Strogatz. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me. Great to see everybody. <laughs> and before we, we go into the, the questions from the audience, uh, okay. I wanted to start with one question, if I can. I wanted to ask you, I mean, because we wouldn't uh, meet here today probably in this format, and probably in, we would meet in a much smaller group, uh, if, not the, if not the coronavirus pandemic. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think about it? Like, um, how did the current situation influence yourself in the context of scientific work or mm -hmm. the work in general? I mean, did you shift your focus, for example, more into writing books because you can do this at home? Or do you find it easier or harder to work? How do you see it? Well, um, it has given me a lot more time with my wife. I, I really like this. I get to, and my dog. That's a positive, that's a positive side. Okay, so I'm, I'm at home and uh, I really like being at home. I think as a person who is a little bit introverted, um, I appreciate the ability to, to just stay home and not have to travel. On the other hand, this kind of travel is really pleasant. You know, I get to go all over the world and see friends and make new friends. So I, I kind of like what has happened as far as the remote opportunities but of course, it's very tragic, all the death. And, and uh, I've had friends who have died. And I mean, I think of the mathematician John Conway, you know, who you, some of you will know from the game of life and other great work that he did. So yes. he, he died of COVID. Many, many people, obviously, it's terrible. But the other thing is it has made me appreciate um, mathematical epidemiology and, and the network science that relates to epidemiology, which for me had been very theoretical until this has been happening. I mean, I never lived through an epidemic before. And so I, it's, it's been very um, sobering, you know, to realize that this work is not just in textbooks. This, we really can help, or in some cases cause trouble for the, the authorities and for people. Um, one other thing that has caused a change is I've been doing podcasting from my home instead of from my off or from uh, Cornell no. studio. So I will just show you my ceiling. I've got yes. <laughs> stuff, which is acoustic foam, um, which is supposed to make the sound a little better. Okay. So it little changes in the house as well. Yeah. So it, uh, it has, it has big influence then. Yes. I mean, I, actually, I'm, I'm very happy if we can do this as a conversation. I would be curious how people, if you're willing to unmute yourselves, um, if anyone would like to tell us how this has affected your life, I, I think we would all be curious to hear. Yeah, so I think we can move on to the 
questions or, or comments from from the audience and i think you can you you, you have the option to unmute yourself sure and uh, just ask a question or a comment or on on the last one yeah i think that professor steven was also asking us to share also our experience and this becoming a conversation uh, right yeah i would like that i i mean i find it more comfortable that way although i i'm happy to keep answering I mean, if you want to think of it graph theoretically, we could do it where I'm a hub and you guys are spokes, but I would like a little more interesting network structure. Yeah, for sure. Actually, I may ask you some tips because I'm about to create my own podcast. So maybe those feeling stuff and so on will be nice to ask you. <laughs> yeah. I, I can tell you a few things. Do you want me to talk about that for a minute? Oh, well, why not? Sure. Or, or were you just kidding around? No, 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 I'm not kidding. I'm really oh, okay. creative. Well, all right. I would recommend getting a good microphone. I'm not using one right now. I'm just using my laptop microphone. But you can get something like this. Oh, nice. Um, which is a, uh, it's, uh, I could type it in the chat. It's, um, let's see here. At the moment, I'm just writing to you privately. I want to write to everybody. Uh, and I'm not so great at Zoom. Why don't I see everyone? Uh, no, oh, there it is. I know, on the blue. Okay, to everyone. Yeah, so for anyone, if you want to improve your microphone, um, there's something called a Yeti Blue, which is, that's a like a broadcast quality microphone. It would cost about $150. There's also something um, a little bit cheaper called the Yeti Snowball. So, so those are good. There are and these wanna... RED microphones, yeah? Yes, yeah. you just plug it into your USB or, or whatever, it just plugs right into your computer. And, um, you know, there's also the question of lighting. If you're gonna be doing any video like we're doing here, I'm just sitting in front of my window. So, so that's good, but um, you can buy a, a light that's a ring light that will give you better illumination. Um, I don't know what to say about podcasting. I'm kind of a beginner at it, so I don't know that I really know what to say. Well, thank you. But, but it is fun, yeah. And that, that has actually been another interesting aspect of the pandemic is I've been thinking of trying to post more stuff on social media, um, like on YouTube. I, I posted a lecture that I did about Newton's work on the inverse square law of gravity, showing that all the the force from a solid sphere acts as if it were concentrated at the center of the sphere, which was something he had to prove in the course of his work on planetary motion. But it was fun to do a video and then post it. And anyway, okay. So let's see, I see some questions in the chat. Here's one. How do I choose what to work on as far as a research problem? And more specifically, why did we work on small world networks? Um, yeah, those questions are related, I would say. I, so I, I like things that have to do with everyday life. I, I don't really like very sciencey science. I mean, I sort of like things that would occur to anybody who is just looking around and paying attention to their everyday life. And so I like especially things that seem paradoxical or surprising. I always think that surprises are a good guide to interesting science. I also don't read the literature very much. So I'm often kind of ignorant about what's fashionable or popular. I don't, I used to read the literature a lot and I loved it, but I lately have been just trying to think for myself, what, what am I curious about? So in the case of the small world problem, um, I had seen the movie Six Degrees of Separation and I remember thinking it was interesting, um, but I didn't think of working on it as a, as a problem. But then my student, Duncan Watts, was looking for a good PhD problem. And we had some trouble finding something good for him. We, we first started working on a problem about oscillations in vessels in the body called the lymphatic system, which is a kind of a part of the immune system. And um, there was some, some colleague who was an expert on lymph nodes and the flow of this weird fluid, the lymph, and we couldn't think of anything good to do with it. So that wasted about maybe like 
several months. Some of you may be experiencing this where you're getting stuck, you know, looking for a good PhD problem or a good postdoc problem. It's a very common experience. At that, that problem we thought was good because we had an experimental collaborator who could guide us, but we couldn't find anything interesting to do. Then, then I got curious about uh, trying to test theories about biological rhythms that there's a lot of theoretical work. You've probably heard of this thing called the Kuramoto model of coupled oscillators, but nobody ever really tests the model against data. And so I was thinking, what's a good data system where we could actually test and see if this model is relevant to anything real? And so I, I realized that we also had some experimentalists at Cornell that work on crickets that chirp in unison and this, this bioacoustics expert told me that we have a very good species of cricket in Ithaca, where I live, and that we could capture these crickets and measure them chirping at each other. So I had Duncan doing that for a while, but then the crickets got a parasite and died. So this can happen in biology, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> so time was going on and, and Duncan was getting nervous about graduating. And so one day he said something to me about, well, actually, while he was thinking about the crickets, he, he began wondering which crickets hear which other crickets. Like, do they all hear each other? Do they only hear their nearest neighbors? And it got him thinking about network structure. And then that made him think of something his father once said to him about, did you realize that you know everyone on earth is connected by only a few degrees of separation? And so then Duncan put those two ideas together in his mind that maybe we should be thinking about how synchronization would change if we knew that a network was connected like a, a small world rather than a lattice or something like a physicist would study. And um, so he suggested maybe we should look into how small worlds influence dynamics. And he asked me, did anyone know anything about that? And I said, no, nobody knows anything about that. And in particular, I didn't know anything about small world structure because I'm not a graph theorist and I never thought about networks before. So he, he said he wanted to work on this, but I said it would be dangerous because I wouldn't be able to advise him very well. And, um, but, but so we decided to just, we were both really curious about it. And so we decided to fool around with it for a few weeks, but we wouldn't tell anyone because we thought we could really embarrass ourselves since we didn't know any sociology and we didn't know any. I mean, in fact, we knew so little sociology that we didn't realize it was called the small world problem. We, we kept calling it six degrees of separation because we knew about it from pop culture. But then at one point when Duncan was looking for a postdoc, so he ended up doing some nice work on this, but um, I mean, really nice work. <laughs> and we had a lot of fun thinking about it, but while we were telling people what we were working on, at one point we told a population biologist named Joel Cohen at Rockefeller that we were working on six degrees of separation. And he said, you mean the small world problem? We never even heard that phrase. So he said, like, you idiots, don't you know that Milgram worked on this? And so my point here is that complex systems science is a very interdisciplinary thing and you can easily embarrass yourself but you can also make great breakthroughs because there's an advantage to being ignorant that, that you don't know, like Joel Cohen and everybody in sociology thought the small world problem was already solved. And we felt it was not solved at all. And that there were really interesting questions about how network structure affects dynamics, which the people in that community never even thought about that. So anyway, I. I think you should use your youth as an advantage to don't, don't read the literature, especially. Don't try to copy what other people are doing. Think about what's interesting for you and have a kind of playful and aggressive attitude. And like, for me, it's helpful to think other people don't know that much, that there's a lot of things waiting to be discovered. Like don't have too much reverence for me or anybody else. Okay, that's probably enough about all that. Oh, thanks for this story. I mean, I wanted to ask you about, about this paper, uh, but yeah, don't read the liter literature. I mean, this is the first time I hear this advice. I like it. Uh. Well, here's why I say it. 
I mean, it depends a lot on your personality and, and some people and some of my students don't listen to me when I say this, which is good. They shouldn't listen. They should do what is natural for them. But for me, when I read the literature, I find it very inhibiting. It makes me feel stupid. It also makes me feel like I can never do anything because it's already been done. So I, I am very intimidated by the past and all the great thinkers and you know creative people who have already invented everything. So for me, if I, if I read stuff, it's very discouraging. Whereas if I am ignorant and I just think about what, what I'm curious about, then um, I feel freedom. Now, the, the risk is that you might do something that someone has already done, right? That's what everybody is worried about, that they're gonna reinvent the wheel. But I have found in my experience that that doesn't really happen unless you work on an extremely well-defined problem. Like if you try to solve a, I, I mean, I did this once, I was looking at something in magnetism called the XY model, and I added a certain kind of randomness to it. And so in effect, I was working on the random field XY model. Well, every statistical physicist knows to do that. So somebody already solved that problem. And so I, I learned a little by doing it, but it was not original. Okay, whereas if you work on something weird and fringy like small worlds or whatever, or like just this morning, I saw someone was working on elevators. You know, you, you go to a, an apartment building, you, you wait for an elevator, and then more people start showing up and they're waiting for the elevator. How does the dynamics of elevators if there are several of them in the building, depend on the rate of arrival of the people and various other things that you might think about. So Sid Redner at, at uh, Santa Fe Institute did this nice analysis of elevator synchronization and other stochastic aspects of elevators. That to me is an interesting kind of problem, you know, because now it turns out a lot of people in civil engineering have already worked on elevators, but Sid apparently, I'm guessing, didn't know that and didn't read the literature because he just wanted to think about it himself. So he did something very creative. But what you have to do is after you've done your work, then you got to learn what other people did. Then you can read the literature and you will find that you did something that no one did before and that you can actually contribute. But, but you have to be respectful because other people may have thought of great things that you have to reference and then they might guide your work. But at that point, you're past the inhibition and you've actually done something original. So again, it depends on your personality. Some people love reading. The other thing is it's very dangerous for a graduate student to read because then you'll just keep reading. I mean, reading is fun. I, I like being a student and I could read for my whole life. But if you're gonna make a name for yourself and make discoveries, you have to do your own damn thing at some point. <laughs> It's a very interesting approach. <laughs> yeah, so that's my own style. Different advisors will give you different advice. Um, I mean, it's traditional to say, oh, you must master the literature before you can do something new. And by studying the literature, you will see where the, the gaps are, where there's room for a new work. Okay, maybe. But I, like I say, my experience is when I read the literature, I just get discouraged. Yes, I'm Leiden, Stephen, let me just ask this something because I think it's important for young researchers being PhD or even postdocs. And I, I apologize to the one that has their hand raised. We yeah, will yeah, yeah. <laughs> to you next. Uh, just this very quick question. So as you were saying, maybe we shouldn't read so much when we are starting and so on. We need to develop our own ideas. Yes. But not all advisors are as humble as that and sometimes they kind of have their own frameworks that they impose to the students yes they're like i have this tool and i want you to use here or that and if you come to you with your own ideas right they are like well i'm not interested in that as a young researcher how can we deal with this in the uh, sense that we want to develop our own research anyway but we yeah. still need the support of the advisor thank you sophia that is a very important point. Really good question. And um, right, what I'm saying is very idealized or idealistic. And it's also dangerous, by the way. I mean, I don't want to um, pretend that my advice is, is reliable. It's risky. Um, like in Duncan Watts's case, when I said, let's fool around with this, we always had the crickets in reserve. 
Like if it wasn't working, we were gonna go back and do serious work on them. Okay, maybe they died one year, but we could collect more the next year. And you know, like we, we felt we could solve that problem. So we had a safe, like we had insurance, but still um, back to your question though, some advisors will have, for example, grant money and they need you to work on a project because there's a, a research assistantship to support you. And so you have to work on that thing. Um, that's a very common situation in engineering, especially, but, but in physics too, sometimes, sometimes in math. Or the advisor is very focused and feels this is what we work on here. And if you're my student, this is what we're gonna do. Um, that kind of advisor can be valuable because you will learn techniques and you'll, you'll get very well educated in something. And you can always try to be more adventurous in your postdoc, which is a time when most people, now that they've got technical training, take, take a more imaginative step. So you could do it that way. That's probably the more standard route, you know, just like master your field as a, as a grad student and then get more creative as a postdoc. But I actually don't advocate that. I, I like doing adventure as a grad student. I really do. And I think because as an advisor who really cares and loves my students, I want to be with them swimming in the dangerous water so that if they start drowning, I can save them. But I want them to have the feeling of the real thing, you know, like real research where you don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, and it might not work at all. I, I just think that, that that's the reason we're in this is for the fun of and the thrill of a real discovery. And I think this is the time to start in graduate school when there's a good advisor, hopefully, who will take care of you. And, um, but obviously many advisors are not like that. And so you have to be careful in how you select your advisor. Should you pick an old famous person? Should you pick a young person who has a lot of energy but not much experience? They may have a lot of ideas. They may not be married yet. They don't have kids, so they have a lot of time. Um, they need to get tenure, so they want your help desperately. But they might not be very good. They haven't established themselves yet. I mean, there's all kinds of questions. I don't know. As an old person now, I can tell you I don't have that many ideas anymore. And I would not advise students to work with me. Um, and I tell them that now. I, I think I was better when I was younger. Um, so I, I personally think that you should try to find the most exciting young person that you can to work with. They don't have to be a professor. You, uh, if you're a grad student, find a smart postdoc to work with. That's a very nice relationship, actually. Two people around the same age who are both eager to do something. Um, a, a postdoc will actually do some work, whereas your advisor probably won't do anything. Uh, you know, so I really think that's, I think you should be focusing on young people who are equally ambitious as you and curious and that you have a good chemistry with. Because if you're gonna do interdisciplinary work, you have to be willing to look stupid and take chances. And so it's helpful if you trust the other person, you know, like they're actually your friend so that you can admit when you don't know something or you're confused. With a power relationship with an advisor, often students feel like they don't want to admit that because they need the advisor to write letters for them and stuff. So I, I just, I don't know. I, I realize these are a lot of unconventional suggestions, but really want my advice, this is my advice. <laughs> No, and just as the disclaimer, actually, during my PhD, I was very lucky because I had two young advisors and they let me just go freely and explore. But uh, talking with the other young researchers, this is a topic that we often uh, come to. So I just wanted to give voice to that concern because of obviously something that I also think about now that I'm a postdoc. Um, and since we have so many young researchers here and maybe they are struggling with this or not, I wanted to just give voice to this question, but maybe we can move to- Yes, let me look also in the chat here. I see some other things. So um, here's a question about what do I suggest for social scientists who are not trained in math or physics um, about doing research in complexity research? Well, I really think collaboration is a, is a very powerful 
technique. So if you are a social scientist, I would recommend looking for an open-minded physicist or computer scientist or mathematician, you know, or engineer, someone with the kind of training that would be complementary to the training of a social scientist. So you will find if you read, for example, literature by physicists working on epidemics or social balance or other social phenomena, that physicists often ask the wrong question from the point of view of social science because they don't have the training. They don't know what the relevant culture is. Um, they ask questions like, you know, I know techniques from Ising models or from network theory or from stochastic processes, and then they'll do work that is driven by the tools rather than by the questions. I would say that's an important distinction. Are you going to be a methodologically driven researcher or a problem driven researcher? There are, you can be very successful with both techniques. I mean, I think of someone like Mark Newman, who is fantastic, you know, at University of Michigan as a very methodologically driven researcher. He, he is a fantastically technically powerful person at statistical physics, renormalization group, network science, and so on. But he has no training in social science or epidemiology. But you will see that he works on those things in collaboration with people like Lauren Ansel Myers, who is a real epidemiologist, you know, or he'll work with sociologists on relevant questions about like uh, citation networks for scientific publication. Anyway, my point would be social scientists have a lot to offer, but I think often it's in the problem selection and in choosing the right questions, which I think we underestimate. That's a really important part of work. Um, so much of undergraduate and, and graduate school is about technical training in how to solve problems. But the really good thing is to pick the problem. Solving, I actually, I think a lot of people can solve problems. That to be really great, you've got to find the right questions. That's hard. And I do think social scientists and biologists have a lot to offer there. And as you said, probably collaboration would be also very important. I think so. I do. I think it would be very hard for a social scientist to do great stuff in complex systems research without some facility with math or computers. You really got to have that. So I think you, you can get it by collaborating with someone who's already good at that. Stephen, I have one more question, if, if, if we have time. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, um, I have uh, like another half hour. OK. Um, you know, complexity research is, a, is an interdisciplinary field. And it's often very difficult to ha get our colleagues to accept the research we do. Do you have any suggestions yeah. about you know, publishing our research in mainstream very journals important. in our field? This is a really important point, and I, I'm not sure what to say. Um, I wish we lived in a world where there were institutes of complex systems that would hire people like us. Um, but, and there are some, but, but not very many. It actually seems to me, you should correct me if I'm wrong about this. It seems to me healthier in Europe than in the United States that I find Europe more open-minded towards complexity research in Spain and Italy and Denmark. I don't know. I, it's really not popular in the US. Um, it's not considered a serious subject. And so I'm in a math department. I used to be in an engineering department. Um, I am a mathematician. I'm very happy to be in a math department, but I'm not really a mathematician the way my colleagues are. I don't prove things. I usually publish in physics journals or biology journals. Um, advice was given to me when I was a grad student that you must be recognized as someone good in some standard discipline. If you're a physicist, you have to look like a good physicist. If you're a social scientist, you have to look like a good sociologist or a good economist. Etc. If if you try to sell yourself as a complexity scientist, it's really going to be tough. I don't want to say that to you, but I feel I have to. I, I really do think you have to make sure that you're an expert in something conventional. So, 
that's unfortunate, but I think it's necessary. And so, so whatever your discipline is, make sure that you look like a good, whatever that is, good sociologist or good physicist or whatever. And then once you get hired, hopefully they realize that you do complexity theory and that they're open to that. But you're, you know, like the jobs are in universities. You, you could get a job with Microsoft or with Google or, you know, maybe with a hedge fund or something. There are jobs out there for complex systems people outside of academics. But assuming you want to be a professor, um, then you're going to have to be hired by a standard department. And so you have to, like to use the immunology metaphor, you have to look like self, not antigen, right? And, and if they think you're antigen, if they think you're some kind of disease, they're not going to hire you. So you have to look like a physicist to a physics department. And um, I don't know, that's my, that, that's my answer. I, I mean, it's unpleasant, but I think that's the way it is for now. Maybe it will change someday. Yeah, we have another question. From well, the other thing too is that uh, because you know what universities really do is teach. Even though we do research, your colleagues are going to make sure they want you to be able to teach. So you have to be able to teach Maxwell's equations and classical mechanics and quantum mechanics if you're a physicist. And um, you can still do network science or some other thing, and they might even want you to do it. But, but you still have to look like a physicist, you know, or substitute biologist or social scientist or whatever else. Okay, yeah, let's take another few questions. Oh, I, I'm also open to, you know, your thoughts about this. Would someone else like to weigh in on yeah. these questions? It's just that we have to raise hands that they want to ask you directly the question. So maybe we can go to, with the violence. I see five new messages in the chat. Yeah, yeah but... We there is go. also the option to raise, or raise hands. Okay, let's do some raised hands. Go ahead, so, Sophia, you could. Well, uh, okay. Uh, hello, good afternoon from Spain. Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, I think that during this pandemic, we all have spent quite a lot of time in front of a screen. Yes. And when you are in front of a screen, you can work or you can procrastinate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, my my question is about time management because I see that you uh, write wonderful books. Uh, you also give your lectures, but on top of that, you are also a lot in in Twitter discussing yes. about elevators, for example. So uh -huh. I would like to know how did you manage to to focus on on your research, especially during these tough days. <laughs> ah, good. Well, um, here I need to admit something that I'm not proud of, which is, as a researcher, my life has changed a lot. I, this I don't think is relevant for you, but just to directly answer your question. Um, I used to really do research. When I was young, as a postdoc or a grad student, I would spend hours, like you, and nights and weekends really thinking and being stuck and doing work in front of a computer or doing pencil and paper or walking around and thinking. And I would do that a lot, but I don't do that anymore. I honestly don't do research like that anymore. It's embarrassing, um, but if I'm telling you the truth, that's the truth. What I do now is I listen to my grad students and postdocs who tell me the research that they're doing and I help them when they get stuck. And occasionally I might do a little calculation or a little computation, but mostly I don't. Mostly I give advice. And so I'm not thinking very much at all. So I don't have this problem that you're asking about. <laughs> okay. The problem that I have is if I have to write a book, which is where most of my creative energy goes nowadays, is to writing for the public um, or suppose maybe I have to write a letter of recommendation for one of you young people, or I have to, um, you know, sit on a grant evaluation panel or something. That's, this is my life as an old person. So how do I manage my time? That was really what your question was. Um, I find I'm very productive in the morning. So I don't look at my email in the morning. I don't 
try not to go on Twitter or do any of these other procrastinating things. Um, I, I get up early. My circadian rhythm is, is very energetic in the morning and I don't look at the goddamn email. Okay, so I just spend six hours doing something serious, but it's not research. It's, it's preparing my class. That's why I missed my session with you. I was preparing my lecture for my class that's in an hour. And I didn't realize that I was supposed to be here earlier. But, um, but so yeah, all creative work gets done when my brain is good at that. And then the rest of the day, I'm, I have meetings and, and then at night I try to be with my family and you know, try also get exercise. I like to play tennis a few times a week and I'm walking the dog. And so I, I think you have to dedicate some time for a young person, usually that will be late at night. I mean, I used to work in the middle of the night. So um, if that's when you're good, just don't check your email and don't do any texting or anything that's gonna distract you when you should be doing your work. Okay. It's just, it's just discipline. I don't know what to say. <laughs> no, yes. Okay. Professor, <laughs> Professor yes. Strogatz, um, yes. thank you very much for coming. Um, yeah, I wanted to contribute actually to this question. So it's a very interesting topic that you touched upon. So if now your, your uh, life is like a meta programming on PhD students and postdocs, then what how should the, uh, the postdocs and PhD students, how should they uh, start their career? Should they be very hardworking or they, sh and you know, going to like technical details, coding a lot, spending nights and um, like doing this really applied work and writing theorems, writing papers, or they should develop their creativity and like read a lot and do, do more like a meta meta research, meta mathematics is more about, so I'm, I'm a mathematician. So um, yeah, so if you mathematicians, yeah, you spend nights like writing formulas, but maybe yeah. you should, you know, being conceptual as a, as a postdoc, because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a postdoc now. Uh-huh. Well, um, I do think that there's a, an evolution that will take place over a person's career, though there's no simple recipe for this. I mean, my, my most important mentor of my life was a guy named Arthur Winfrey. So Art Winfrey was trained as a biologist, but his undergraduate degree was in, in physics. And um, he was very topological. He was really interested in applying topology to questions in biology. You may have heard of his book, Geometry of Biological Time. So Winfrey was a very interdisciplinary guy and he did research his whole life until the day he died. So he was not the way, I mean, his career did not follow the path I'm personally taking. In fact, he almost never had graduate students. Um, nobody ever wanted to work with him. He was a sort of difficult person in some ways. He would tell you what he actually thought. So he was very honest and he could be very insulting. Um, but he was very easy to talk to because you knew exactly what he was thinking all the time. And he was also hard on himself. He wasn't like he was malicious. He just didn't have any filter. Anyway, he was a guy who did research his whole life. So you can be an old person and still very active with research um, as well as with these conceptual questions that you're talking about, what you are calling meta questions. I, I mean, in my own case, it has not worked like that. I was always relatively weak technically. I mean, in, in college, I would say I was the worst of all the math majors at Princeton in terms of ability to do difficult, pure math of, you know, delicate things in real analysis or algebra. I, I was bad. I just was bad. <laughs> I was slow and just not very smart. But I loved the subject a lot. And I was very good at making connections. So I would see things in my physics classes that reminded me of things in my math classes, or especially I would see things in biology that reminded me of differential geometry or stuff like that. And so even though I was slow and weak, I was broad. So for me, seeing the connections, doing easy things in another discipline, like for instance, my first work was about knot theory and differential geometry of DNA. And 
these were relatively easy things that if you were a mathematician, if, if you got a biologist to explain the problem to you, and if you knew enough biology to understand what the biologist was saying, these would be relatively trivial problems for any good mathematician. But the thing is, most mathematicians are so narrow that they don't even know there's a biologist over there who has a problem. So my strength was conversation, being nice, being open to all kinds of weird stuff. And so I was able to exploit my, my meager math knowledge to, and still make a contribution by being broad. So you kind of have to do what you're good at. If you're really technically strong and you love that stuff, then I would do that. But um, I, I think there's a lot of room for all different styles of people. And school doesn't necessarily show that. In school, we do reward technical power more than anything, especially solving problems that are already in a textbook. But that is irrelevant for research where you need to think of good questions. Um, actually, there's two styles. I mean, I was talking to the great mathematician, Bella Balabash, who some of you will know as a, you know, written a famous book on random graphs. And he's, I, I had this conversation with him at Cambridge one time where I said, is it more important to think of new questions or should you solve outstanding old famous questions? And he said, it's a completely stupid question. The only game in town is to solve longstanding classic problems. That's what you do. That's what you should do. You should be trying to solve old, hard problems. He, he's felt it was trivial to invent new questions. So in his value system, what I do is, is of no worth whatsoever. So there's different taste, you know, it's different people care about different things. Anyway, but, but Alexei, so your question was, when in your career should you think about these meta questions? I don't know what to say. I mean, someone like Balabash has never thought about them his whole life and he doesn't care and he's a great mathematician. So whereas I've been thinking about them since I was 20 years old and I've had a good career too, but you know, I'm, I'm a very weak mathematician compared to Balabash, but I think I've had much more impact on science than he will ever have because of my openness to other disciplines. So I don't know what to say. You've got to pick what you are good at and, and emphasize that. Yes. Thank you very much. Actually, I think your answer was much more broad than my question. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so I, I suggest maybe we, yeah. I, I just I want to say that I, I, I can't give a precise answer because the, the meta, meta answer is try to be introspective. Be honest with yourself about where, what you love to do and what you're good at. And actually, this was advice given to me by Winfrey when I started to work with him. Um, I, I worked with him after my undergraduate degree, before I started graduate school. And I... I loved his book. It really inspired me, Geometry of Biological Time. I heartily recommend it. But while I was reading this book, um, I wrote to him and said, could I work with you somehow over the summer? And he said, okay, sure. And then he, he said, here are 50 problems that I think are interesting. He wrote out a big list of like 50 interesting things. I'm not kidding. He had so many ideas. And he said, you need to pick one or two of these that grips you irrationally by the imagination. This was the phrase that stuck in my mind all these years, it's now 40 years ago. He said, it must grip you irrationally by the imagination. And what he meant was, you have to find one of these 50 problems that makes you so excited that you think about it in the shower, that you think about it when you're driving, you think about it before you go to bed, and it should be irrational. It's not that you can say this is important for cancer research or there's a good reason why I'm interested in this. That is not how it works. It has to be emotional. It has to be irrational. I love this problem. I can't even tell you why I love it. I just love it so much. So he said it has to grip you. And then the reason was because otherwise nothing remarkable can be expected to happen. If you wanna do something remarkable, you have to have passion. And so be honest about what really excites you and don't do something routine because then you'll just do routine work. Mm -hmm. So this was Winfrey's advice. And this is kind of my advice to you. 
It takes courage, but try to find something that you really love irrationally. Yes, this is really inspiring. I hope you still have some time because we have uh, I do, I do, a lot of, of questions. So I do. Next sorry, question, my answers are so long, but I do. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's very, very nice to hear. Thank you. Uh, the next question I want to uh, point to Rodrigo. Uh, he had his uh, hands. Okay, yes, Rodrigo. Hi, how are Please. you? Thank you so much uh, for this uh, very interesting and very inspiring conversation. I'm really enjoying this a lot. Oh, good, um, thank you. Me too. So, um, I'm Rodrigo, I'm from Mexico and I'm right now in Montreal in McGill. <clears throat> I am yes. a PhD student and I'm trying to ask you um, a little bit of a quite personal question that may uh, take you back to, to your PhD or undergraduate years. Uh, how did you ever encounter any uh, of this uh, so-called uh, imposter syndrome? Did you ever feel oh. that this uncertainty yeah. of what is going, am I good enough for this? Am I going to make it? Is there, uh, yes. what was the role of mental health in your development and how did you deal with that? Oh, the wonderful question. Um, I hope you can sort of hear from my answers in this session that I still have imposter syndrome. I do. I've had it my whole life. I think, I think the only people who do not have imposter syndrome are the people who have mental health problems. I think any reasonable person, must, you must have imposter syndrome. There are so many great people and all of us have so many weaknesses that it's, you have to be a psychopath or some kind of egomaniac to think that you deserve the good things that have happened to you. I mean, I, okay, this I'm telling you from someone who still has imposter syndrome. Um, I don't know what to say. I, I, uh, for me, it was a very formative experience to take linear algebra in my first year in college. So in high school, I was, I was a very exceptional student. You know, there were, there were other students even then who were smarter than I was in math. Um, I think of one guy named Ben Fine. So Ben Benjamin Fine was um, a student who when our teacher would in calculus would give us certain problems to think about. Ben Fine could always find a very elegant solution. He would find the right coordinate system. He would find the right way to look at the problem. He would be effortless. He could, everything looked so easy the way he did it. Um, but he was actually more interested in things like philosophy and French literature and other fields. He what, didn't really like math. It was not that interesting to him, but he was super smart. I, however, loved math and uh, I actually love all of school, but I love math. And I was, like I say, really slow, but really determined. So I remember when I learned analytic geometry, you know, where you can write the equation for a line in Cartesian coordinates or an ellipse or a hyperbola. And so any question in geometry, I would convert it into analytic geometry and then do some horrible algebra. And then I could prove everything with algebra, but it didn't require any ingenuity. You could just calculate. And as long as you don't make any algebra mistakes, you could solve everything. And so I was very good at that. I, would, I was not creative, but I would never make a mistake in algebra. Okay, so I was sort of stupid and a plodding machine and it would take a long time, but I could do everything. So anyway, I, then I go to college and now I'm at Princeton with all these, you know, like best math students in the United States. And I'm the worst one in, in the rigorous linear algebra class where they're asking us to prove things like the dimension of a finite dimensional vector space is well-defined. Okay, which is like, what do I calculate? I can't take a derivative. Like, I don't know what to do. What, what are you even asking me? So I was taking all these pure math courses about, you know, things about compact sets or, and I was terrible. I didn't know what to do. And I had what mathematicians refer to as mathematical maturity. I had no mathematical maturity. I was just a calculating machine. And so I sucked at math and, um, and it was really discouraging. And my teacher was terrible and the book had no pictures in it. And it made linear algebra seem really hard and abstract. 
which actually linear algebra is beautiful and visual, but I didn't know that at the time. So, so I was really bad and I thought I, I should have really failed the course, but I got a B minus, which was a very low grade, honestly. I deserved lower than that. So in terms of imposter syndrome, I mean, I really felt like I'm terrible, you know? So what kept you, what kept <laughs> okay, so you what from happened? giving up? Yeah, so what happened? Okay, so then the next semester I took the rigorous um, advanced calculus course where it was all kinds of stuff about compact sets and heine borel theorem and again, no nothing to calculate. So I, I thought this is no good. So I, I talked to an advisor in the math department. He said, you should take the engineering calculus course. I think you'll find that more concrete. You'll probably, okay, that I could do easily. I mean, so there I was just, that was very familiar and it was helpful for me in my electricity and magnetism course in physics and I could do everything and I was good again. So I thought I, now at that time in my life, I didn't know that there was a subject called applied math. I only knew the math that they taught at Princeton, which is pure math. So I, I didn't, I knew I was good at physics and I could do anything with calculus, but I, I couldn't do this other kind of math very well. So, so I thought, okay, well, I'll start taking these engineering math courses. But, but then there was the next year, a course in complex analysis that was taught by a famous mathematician named Stein. Eli Stein, who was Terry Tao's advisor and who was a fantastic mathematician, but he was also a fantastic teacher. So I took this class with Stein on complex variables and um, it was the most thrilling class. It was absolutely beautiful and I could understand everything. And even though these other math majors were, were smarter than I was, because it was basically calculus except with complex numbers, um, I could do that stuff all day long until we got to the hard part, like the Riemann mapping theorem, then I didn't understand that. But, but anything with doing contour integrals or, anyway, the point was there was a certain kind of math I was good at and a certain kind that I could never really do unless with tremendous effort and I would never be good at it. So I gradually learned what I was good at and what I was not good at. And I just decided um, I can, I can be, I mean, I was the best student in that class. So even though these other people were better, it turns out they have their own problems. Okay, so this is, this is helpful. If you have imposter syndrome, you have to realize that other people have problems too. So other people like my friend, Ben Fine, he wasn't interested in math, that was his problem. <laughs> um, the other people at Princeton, some of them had serious mental illnesses of their own. Like they, they were depressed or they, couldn't function for one reason or another, um, or they were not diligent. They didn't have mental illness, but they weren't good, good workers. They didn't have good work ethic. So I don't know, everybody has their own problems and you just gotta try to compensate for the ones you have and emphasize what you're good at. And don't be too hard on yourself, nobody's perfect. I mean, we can all contribute, that's the point. We can all contribute and if you just have to be open with you're not good at some things, you're good. Now, this goes totally against current thinking in educational theory. You may have heard about growth mindset and grit, right? Grit is that you should work hard and growth mindset is you're not, like I keep saying I wasn't good at pure math. I would be told by people like Joe Bowler or Carol Dweck, the psychologists, Stephen, you're modeling the wrong thing here. You should be saying I could do abstract algebra, it's an exciting challenge. I should just work harder. And well, yes, I could do it, but I'm never gonna be any good at it. <laughs> Whereas geometry is very easy for me, it just is. So I, I don't think I really believe, I mean, you have to work. Okay, too long of an answer. Thank you so much, it has been really inspiring, thank you. All right, what do you think? Tell me about your, Rodrigo, tell me about your own imposter syndrome. How are you dealing with it? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I think what are you, what are you worried about? Um, I guess I guess you never know, uh, just a little bit as where you were mentioning earlier in terms of not reading, you, you have a, a little bit of a different way to estimate how good or how original are your ideas? How far can you really go? until you actually know the, the field. And when you know the field, you very often come with the, uh, find with 
a lot of uh, intimidating and amazing people who are super smart and um, so you you really feel like oh well I was uh, playing with uh, toys at this point mm. so um, you know that that's where uh, sometimes the, my creativity or my freedom and this uh, as you called it the, this irrational obsession with some questions uh, falls into um, yeah but that's not going to be enough you know but then trying to go back to that uh, uh, enjoyment of the problem solving itself just by itself. It's it's a little bit hard when you try to compose it with the rest of the equation of okay, I want to be a professor. What does it take? What is the competition? How how do I get there and so on? And uh, what am I gonna do if I fail? Uh, mm-hmm. If I finish two a year, it's my second postdoc, and then I realize that I'm not good at this. Uh, not not only the career opportunities, but the the, the emotional uh, uh, ch- challenge that goes with it. So. I think yeah. that I'm, I'm generalizing a little bit because I think that many of graduate students and postdocs uh, ha- have these fears and these anxieties. So sure, we all do. We all do. I mean, just to give a little more of a story, if you want to hear a story, I'll try not to make it so long. For me, a, a pivotal moment was in my final year of undergraduate. So I I had had these discouraging experiences of getting bad grades. All my worst grades in college were in math. I got good grades in every other subject. All my lowest grades were in math for the reason I said that I, when I took abstract algebra or topology or, or these other things that were more pure, I was bad. And even when I tried hard, I just wasn't that good. So, so I had really serious doubts about could I be a math professor at that point in my life. But when I was uh, in my third year of college out of four, my parents said, you should be a doctor. So they said, why don't you take all the pre-med courses before it's too late? You would make a good doctor. And I, being a good boy, I did that. I actually took organic chemistry and biology, freshman biology and freshman chemistry all at the same time, in, which was three labs a week, which was really hard for somebody who's not good in the lab. And I didn't like the lab, but I did actually like <clears throat> what I was learning in biology, especially about DNA. I thought it was very interesting. And um, especially like that the geometry of the double helix told you how replication would work. You could immediately understand from the double helical structure and base pairing how this was going to work. So I thought biology was pretty cool. And uh, I had a good differential geometry course that year. And so I I had to do a senior thesis like everybody else. And so I started working on something about geometry of DNA that my advisor suggested to me. I didn't know this problem. I said, I wanna do something with geometry and biology. And he said, well, there's a good problem about, this guy's name was Fred Almgren, who worked on soap bubble geometry, minimal surfaces. He was the closest thing that Princeton had to an applied mathematician. And so he said, do this thing about DNA geometry. And I started learning about it and I really liked it. And then at some point, someone told me there's a biochemist here at Princeton who, is an expert on this, why don't you go talk to him? So I talked to this guy and he, I had an idea and he said, your idea is terrible. And he kind of laughed me out of his office. So, okay. So then I kept thinking some more and I worked on some other stuff. And then I went back to him another, he was actually from Argentina, this guy, really great, very emotional, lively person. Abraham Warsell was his name, Abe Warsell. And he would get all excited. <laughs> I think he was <laughs> actually manic. Manic. <laughs> I think he might have been manic depressive. Unfortunately, he he committed suicide later. So I think he had real serious mental illness. But he was wonderfully energetic, and I love this guy. And so he so I went back to him the second time with a different idea, and he said, "This idea is better than your first idea, but it's still not the correct. It's still no good. If you want to work on something interesting about DNA." this is the problem that everyone is breaking their heads on. And then he started describing a certain problem to me. And as he described it, then I understood, I knew how to solve that problem. And I said, I could do that this afternoon. And he said, oh, you're an idiot. Let me explain it to you again. And I said, no, I'm serious. I know how to do that problem. It was actually a very easy math problem for anyone who knew the basic stuff that I had learned earlier that year in my work. So I did, I went back that afternoon and I solved it and I came back and showed it to him. And he was jumping around the laboratory saying, this is gonna be big. 
you know, like this is going to solve this important problem. And I thought this was so easy. I had no problem <laughs> doing this at all. So in terms of imposter syndrome, what I discovered was even though I kept getting bad grades in my math course, um, when it came to doing research and talking to someone in a different field and being broad, that I had this background, I, I knew enough biology that I could understand the question. Anyway, and like I say, I was able to use my relatively meager tools to solve a problem that was important to someone else. And it turned out it was big. It's in textbooks now, became a famous thing. So that's an amazing anecdote. But so it's, it's really important that when you feel this imposter syndrome, I don't know, um, well, okay, I, I, too long on that, but you, you get the idea. You, the, oh, I, I guess the, the moral of that story was that there's a lot of luck involved. So I'm making it sound like if you just follow your heart, everything will work out well. That's not true. There are a lot of people who are doing everything I'm suggesting and they have bad luck and I had good luck. So, so there's like survivor bias, as they would say in, in the cognitive science literature. What I'm telling you will not necessarily work for you. I, I have to be honest about that. You have to get lucky. And, and one part of getting lucky is to try a lot of things and to have good taste. You have to try to develop good taste. So try many things and if they don't work, be willing to quit. That would be another bit of advice I would give, strategic quitting. Some people will tell you don't quit. No, I don't agree with that. Don't quit immediately, but be ready to quit. I mean, like I said, with Duncan Watts, we tried this problem about the lymph system and it didn't work, we quit. We tried the problem about crickets, that wasn't working well, so we quit that. Don't, don't be a person who, like your high school football coach told you never be a quitter. I don't agree at all. You should be a quitter. Be a quitter because you have good taste and you can tell when something is not working. Because there's a million things to do. Everything that you do creates an opportunity cost for not doing something else. So um, have try to develop good taste. And I don't know how to do that except um, read the work of people that you admire. And I don't know, that's very subjective, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to try to have develop good taste and then be willing to try stuff, work hard, but then quit if it's not working well. I really appreciate all of this. Really, thank you so much, okay. Professor Stroberts. I'm going to let other people ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As well. yeah, uh, yeah. It's been wonderful. Really, I'm sorry, I feel so sad to say this, but we are really approaching the end of the warm up. Um, I don't do know. I still have time. I could, I can, I could do a few more minutes, but I'll try to be quicker on the answer. Okay. If everyone wants to keep, we keep going. Uh, we just wanted to overload you so much. Yeah, I, I should really uh, stop, but I let me try to be quicker on the answer. It's then, a pleasure for us. Actually, this has been very, very inspiring. So we really appreciate. It. We have some uh, questions in the chat, or if someone wants to well, ask. Let me ask actually, Sophia, while you're while I have you. So you say you were recording this. Yes. People, can I get people's permission for what? Could we post this on YouTube or something? Yes, yeah, so we can ask. We're uh, discussing that right now. <laughs> but we, we let uh, people know that this was being recorded. So uh, actually, we were discussing that or even make this a podcast episode. Who knows? That's what I'm thinking. If I think we should post it somewhere where it's freely available so that other students around the world, if they're curious, could look yes. at it. That would be our pleasure for sure. Maybe, yeah. Sophia, sorry, we can just set it the window where Professor Stroger is, uh, is talking so other people don't show it. It's just, ah, but there are voices. Uh, there are, but I mean, if- We'll sort the technological details later. And we've, okay. we've, we're already oh, sorry, recording. Sorry, 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 sorry. It, it makes it very nice, I think, gives it a real human touch to see, you know, questions from Tomas, Rodrigo, you know, Violeta, whatever, it's great. So yeah. I hope you guys will agree to let your faces be shown but up to you. Okay, so let's see, what else do we have? Uh, here's a hard question. Like G.H. Hardy said, math is a young man's game, which nowadays, I guess we would say a young person's game. Um, I've addressed some moments where there's an optimal combination of energy, ambition, experience. Yeah, do I feel many older researchers got way past that point and could perhaps deconstruct things they've said or stood for? That's an interesting question. Sometimes Nobel Prize laureates may use their established reputation to defend something that is scientifically questionable. So interesting, like Michael Levitt is doing right now with coronavirus. Do you know this guy? Is that his name? 
Michael oh. Levitt, who was a great uh, biophysicist, I think, worked on DNA structure, if I remember right. And he's now going on and on about stuff about coronavirus that's really wrong and dangerous. He, he's Levitt one of the MDM. herd immunity people. And what's that, Tomas? And Michael Levitt with double T at the end? Yes. Yeah. He's a Nobel laureate who's saying a lot of bullshit right now. Um, okay, Bud, Fatih, you have your hand up there. What was the question though? How do I see this process of recognizing our limits at any point? Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what? I mean, people are telling Levitt that he's crazy, but he's very stubborn. He thinks, well, I'm a Nobel laureate and I know what I'm doing. And he, he tries to make good arguments, but he's not being honest intellectually because he's not taking seriously the very powerful criticisms of the things he's saying. And I think he's using his reputation in a dangerous and destructive way. Um, yeah. Okay, yes, please go ahead. Uh, so hands uh, up, anyone. This question is especially for my young uh, colleagues here. Um, I don't know what the situation is in Europe, but in the US universities are struggling uh, because of the COVID-19 outbreak. So my question to you is, what do you recommend to um, all these PhD students and postdocs when they go into the job market and how should they market themselves and what do you recommend to them when they get into the academia for navigating all these academic politics? Oh, academic politics, okay. So let's see, what I was gonna recommend wasn't so much about politics as we didn't talk about communication yet, but I really think you should try to work on your communication skills, um, meaning writing and speaking and listening actually. But being a good writer and communicator will really help you in your career. This is aside from the technical stuff of whatever math or physics or social science you're doing. Trying to be clear, to be engaging, to be um, genuine and fun, and but especially clear more than anything. It will help you when you're writing grant proposals. You'll have more chance of getting funded if people understand what you're doing. Um, your papers will get accepted in better journals if you can explain why what you're doing is relevant and, and new. And I think we don't spend enough time on that in grad school. And so try to read good writers who might be novelists or that, like not just scientists. Um, I would recommend books by uh, Steven Pinker's book, The Sense of Style, is an interesting book on writing. Um, we're, so it's not just like f picking fancy words. It's, it's trying to be coherent so that one sentence leads logically into the next and the reader isn't feeling constantly, why am I going here? Why are, like, you have to have a train of thought that is conversational and pleasant. And also don't read or don't use as models most academic writing. Most academic writing is terrible. It's really terrible, especially in math. I mean, math has a huge communication problem. We're the worst. Um, our colloquia are terrible. The physicists are better, even the theoretical physicists. If you go to a physics colloquium, they have a good introduction. You start to understand why the problem matters. Anyway, so, so back to the question though, about how, you know, for young people trying to get ahead, I really think working, like there's a natural tendency to try to be impressive. You want your stuff to sound hard and deep, but that's this imposter syndrome again. You, you're, if you've been working on something, it will seem interesting, even if it seems easy to you. If you explain it clearly, and if the question was good, don't worry, it will be deep enough. It really will. Don't try to be impressive by being obscure. That's a big mistake. So I think in terms of academic politics and all that, if you're really clear and honest and, and kind of modest in a way, um, people will like you and that helps. People want a colleague that they can understand. And so I don't know. I mean, I haven't really talked about the politics per se. Um, what did you have in mind about politics when you asked that? Well, when people you know, get into a department as a junior faculty, um, they have to understand the power structure in the department. Sometimes within their college, they have to figure out what's going on. Right now with the COVID-19, there are uh, fewer resources available, especially uh, for yeah. junior faculty. So they have to find a way 
that they will get the money, they will get um, graduate assistance if available, they will need course reduction and whatnot for mm -hmm. conducting their research or teaching the courses that they want to teach. So they have to navigate their, all this political environment that they are in. Do you have any suggestions for mm -hmm. uh, junior faculty or future These junior faculty? Questions. Wow. I don't know. I, I haven't really lived through that exactly trying to think what I ever did to navigate any politics. I mean, I did, did have some political troubles over the years. Um, I taught at MIT, those colleagues didn't respect the work I was doing, which is how I ended up leaving MIT. Uh, they thought it wasn't deep, which is true. I, like I keep saying, I'm not very deep. But so yeah, my, my stuff didn't fool them. <laughs> um, they wanted pure technical horsepower. That was their value system and they didn't think I had it. They told me, we want you to hit a home run. We, we hope you will hit a home run. That's what they always use as baseball metaphor. Do something really big. And I was trying, but nothing I did seemed big enough to them. So, uh, so I don't know. I mean, yeah, and you raised the question about money. Um, Mm, these are hard questions. If I may jump in there. Uh, sure, just, please. Just to connect on, on what you were saying previously in terms of communication, not only scientific communication, but also I think that communicating in a professional uh, area is also super important for politics because the people who will state their point to, across uh, very uh, clearly and very uh, decisive, uh, then th that's going to open a lot, of, a lot of doors, I think, as well. And, uh, avoid a lot of issues and problems if you do a strategic communication in politics. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, certainly an important thing for a young person is to have allies who are older, powerful people in a department. So if you can find natural chemistry with, with one of your older colleagues, they can be your advocate for all kinds of things from promotion to writing letters for you or whatever. And so... I don't know how to do that. I mean, if you do it in a very political, obvious way, that's not gonna work. People can see through that. So I think you just have to try to find some natural affinity with someone and, and be friendly and get them to let them know you and you know them and hopefully they're powerful enough that they can help you. But I don't know, this is, I guess I never really thought about it that much and I'm not so sure I'm any good at it. It is important. I do think that communication goes a long way, both for getting the money and um, for promoting your own work. You might cynically think of it as salesmanship, like you're selling a bad product, but I, I still think that's imposter syndrome speaking. Everyone, it's not salesmanship. I don't like that term. I mean, I'm sure people accuse me of selling my stuff, but I'm just trying to explain what we were doing and why it was so much fun and why it's so interesting. And I think that that's, I, I actually come from a mentality of, in my heart, I'm a teacher. That's my number one interest. I really like being a teacher and an explainer. And so even when I'm writing academic papers, like say the small world paper, if you read that paper, you can tell I'm trying to teach. I'm just trying to explain our idea. It's not a very technical paper. And you know what else is, so I think you might find an interesting trick that we do in that paper is that the paper is very open. It's when you read that paper, it's obvious that there are a million interesting things that we should do that we didn't do. Many people would see that as a negative thing. Like you didn't really solve the problem. Why didn't you finish the problem? And yet that's a very naive understanding of academic politics. It's better to make work for other people. If you do something that's interesting, but obviously incomplete, it gives other people a chance to improve it and to do something cool and then they'll cite you. And so that paper is now one of the hundred most cited papers of all time in any discipline. And it's because it's so incomplete, but very stimulating. So, you know, opening up a new field, uh, of course, that's a good thing if you can do it, but in general, you don't have to worry that your work is incomplete. It, it's actually a plus if it's interesting, but incomplete. So, but, but I think by communicating that and not being afraid to admit that, that was a plus in that paper. I think that's part of the reason for the success of that paper. 
Okay, so speaking of teaching, I have to teach in a few minutes, so I better stop. But thank you guys, this was really fun. Thank you so much. Before you leave, maybe we could just ask the people that want to turn on the camera so we can take like a screenshot with Steven. So ah. we oh, that's nice. Memory. Uh, and since we are recording it, we also get, we can scroll. Yeah, scroll through. But yeah. <laughs> so you can say hi, goodbye, smile. Yeah, bye, everyone. <laughs> Good luck in your careers. It's really been a pleasure talking with all you young folks. Thank and you. Let me, Thank you know, you. let me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Something I can do. Uh, you know, you could send me email. I might take a long time to answer, but I'll try to be helpful. Thank you so much. I think I can say thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.